Well, hello, uh, hello, good morning, good afternoon, or, or well, good evening, where, from depending where, where you're joining. Um, my name is Jesus Barraza, and I'm I'm being your host today for this uh, webinar on uh, graph-based uh, real-time inventory and topology for network automation. So we we're having today uh, uh, one of our customers, Elisa, who's going to share their experience using Neo4j in that particular space. But before, let me share with you some housekeeping rules. So this uh, this webinar uh, is going to be recorded, so it's going to be available for all offline uh, like watch, just for you to know. Also, um, the, if you join, you will have access to an interface where you can submit questions, which we will uh, try to address at the end of the webinar. And um, I think other than that, that's um, that's it. So just uh, enjoy the content and let me continue by introducing uh, our speaker today. I mean, I am, as I was saying, Jesus Barraza, I'm the head of Telco Solutions with Neo4j. And with me today, I have a Temu Nikanen from uh, Elisa. He's a service architect. We'll uh, listen to him in a minute and, and, and know more about him. But uh, I was thinking that maybe it would be a good idea, especially for those of you who are less familiar with Neo4j, to give a very, very brief introduction to what we are uh, uh, as a platform and how are we used uh, spe specifically in the, in the telco space. So um, yeah, let me start by uh, uh, talking uh, about the Neo4j the Neo graph platform. So we are, we are the leaders in, in this connected data space. And uh, we think uh, of data as connected entities. So we're a particular type of data store, data platform that represents data, not in terms of sets, not in terms of, of, uh, of tabular structures, key values. We can present data as connected entities. That's, uh, that's the model that's at the core of our, of our platform. But uh, uh, we see that uh, uh, graphs can be used in transactional scenarios. We'll talk a little bit about that but they can also be used in analytical scenarios. Graphs also uh, lend themselves naturally to visual exploration. That's what we have. Uh, this area here where uh, business users, data scientists will explore and, and, and eventually visualize graphs to, to, to get insights from them. But we'd also see uh, that uh, another common way of consuming graphs is uh, building applications on top of them, automated use of the graphs that can involve the construction of APIs. And there's a number of elements that simplify these tasks, like the, the drivers that ship with our platform. Also, uh, uh, the, the process of ingestion into, of data into the graph is facilitated by a number of components that is uh, the, the um, the mapping of, of, uh, of data into, into the graph. So that's, that's what we are. We are the platform for connected data. And uh, what's our role? What's our presence in the, in the telco space? Let me tell you briefly, well, first of all, why? What's common to most of our, and I hope this, uh, this set of ideas that I've collected from our customer base is aligned with what Temu is gonna tell, is gonna tell us uh, in a minute. But some of the key typical requirements, I would say, of, of customers that, that uh, decide to, to use graphs is the, is the need to capture complexity. So they're typically highly complex domains, highly connected, where uh, all the types of representation introduce additional or, or artificial complexity. We'll see that graphs are a natural way of representing things like uh, networks, which are connected entities, topologies, multiple layers. So this, uh, uh, this ease, this kind of natural way of, of capturing, accommodating complexity is one of the challenges that, we, that the graph model needs. Uh, there's also the, the need for flexibility. So uh, be, being able to adapt your model as your, uh, your data changes without having to go through painful migrations is another characteristic that also the graph as, as, a, as a NoSQL uh, kind of a schema implicit, if we want to call it like that, platform uh, uh, needs as well. And finally, there's a, there's a very common need for performance. And that's also a characteristic of, uh, of Neo4j as a, as a graph native platform. And we'll probably talk a little bit more about that later. So this uh, uh, idea of uh, not only great performance, but predictable performance that's guaranteed by the fact that we persist the connections between data points that, uh, that then accelerates and, and makes uh, querying uh, fast, but also predictable, as I was saying. So these are some of the common elements. And uh, in terms of adoption, I have to say that, me, that uh, the, the telco industry is one of the largest ones for us. 
We have a strong presence directly with, uh, with um, communication service providers, and we have a great example today with Elisa. But we have also, uh, you can see some logos there. Some of the largest in the world are, are, are using Neo4j for, for, uh, for um, some critical projects and critical solutions. But we also have a strong presence in, in uh, OSS uh, uh, vendors, OSS platforms. And these are the operations and support systems the, basically, the software that uh, uh, communication service providers, the telco companies, use to to design and to operate their networks and the, their networks, and and these are you know the Nokia's, the Cisco, Sienna, as you can see there. So a very strong uh, uh, presence, and and it's one of these industries that has grown organically from the very beginning. So it's always been a, a significant portion of our of our uh, of our business. So and uh, but what what uh um some of the common use cases which are the areas and i'm going to focus i've tried to represent it here in a in a in a graph so uh i'll focus of course on the uh on the area uh, closer to the network because that's the topic of the day so um we see that, that there's a number of use cases in that space things like uh, uh planning and design where you know the, the graph algorithms play play a big role the graph algorithms are available with our platform Things like uh, monitoring, like unified inventory, which is exactly the top the topic of, of today, or characteristics like the flexibility of our model or the transactionality, which is uh, critical. Keep, you know, make sure that the graph will keep your data, uh, um, the integrity of your data. Uh, but other areas like service assurance are equally common, where fast traversals are, are, are extremely useful, because what we do in this type of, of, uh, of use cases is represent dependencies between elements in a, in a network topology across across layers and then being able to traverse them to, to, to run impact analysis, to run root cause analysis is going to be critical. So a very, very rich set of use cases, as you can see, with, uh, with some features that are critical for each of them. I'll leave uh, uh, for today uh, other areas like Internet of Things, like closer to the customer and the services, BSS, or the webinars. But as you can see, it's a pretty, re pretty rich set of, of, uh, of use cases. But yeah, I said I wanted to be brief. I think I've already gone over my, my five uh, allocated minutes. So let me um, go uh, straight to the, to the center of our, of our webinar today. And, and, uh, and let me thank you, uh, Temu, again, for joining us today. And um, so, um, why don't we start, Temu, if um, if you're okay with that, by by giving us uh, a little bit of context on 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 who uh, who's Elisa, where where are you based, and and also a little bit about yourself. So, what's your your role in the in the organization? And uh, remember to unmute yourself. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. So yes, and uh, hello to everyone. Uh, I'm Temu Nykänen, service architect at Elisa. And uh, I would say that uh, I'm a software guy drifting in the sea of network automation. Uh, so I have a software background and I've been in business for a ra rather long time. And currently I'm overseeing the development of Elisa's in-house core network automation solution. And uh, as many of you might not know what, what Elisa is, is or does, we might have a Next slide to kind of explain a few things. So Elisa is a Finnish teleoperator, and uh, actually much more than that nowadays. Uh, company is dating back to 18th century, although name has changed since. And uh, I would say that Elisa's journey is characterized by making new discoveries and challenging prevailing practices. And yes, I do know that sounds like a marketing speech, but it is true because at different stages, Elsa has been a pioneer in almost every aspect of telecommunications technology. And uh, in this timeline, you can notice at least two interesting things. First one is the automation, which has been important to us since, I would say, early 19th century. And the other one, is the ever so trendy 5G, which has a big role in our network automation also. And uh, I think we can move on. Here are some key figures. Let's not spend too much time here, but, uh, but we have uh, around 2.8 million customers 
and uh, about 4,800 employees. So we are not exactly a startup anymore. Hmm. And uh, we are uh, number one in Finland and number two in Estonia. And uh, I think we can move on. Just to kind of give you a hint about the market in Finland, the market is highly competitive. We are at the top and we would like to stay there. And uh, yeah, I think we can move on. But this is the interesting part in this context, because in addition to being just a, just a operator and offering wide spectrum of services to customers and corporations in Finland and Estonia, we are also active in international markets. Uh, we provide you know, digital services, for example, services related to visual communication, entertainment services, cloud-based IT services. They are all part of our portfolio. <clears throat> and uh, our international services are strongly based on our own capabilities and our core business, as well as well, few carefully selected acquisitions. So, in other, other words, we eat our own dog food and only sell things that we use by ourselves. The Elisa Automate is the most interesting part in this slide. Elisa Automate offers network automation services to other operators who actually are not our competitors unless they are active in the same market. And we are offering services like a radio access network optimization automation and have actually struck few deals already in that area. And we were presenting some of our solutions during NVC at Barcelona. And we, we tend to continue in this path. I think we can move in the next slide. Uh, as I mentioned, we have been pioneering tele and mobile communications and we invest nearly 200 million euros in our data networks and systems every year. And as a market leader, we also pioneer in new te network technologies and innovations such as 5G. And uh, we actually already have 5G network publicly available. Coverage is still, of course, rather limited, but it is there and you could use it if, if you happen to have a 5G-enabled device, which you probably don't. Uh, we want to be first to provide new services, fastest connections, and uh, most comprehensive coverage to our customers. And uh, this is not always easy, as Finland is the mobile data capital of the world which means that uh, Finns use more mobile data per subscription than anyone else. So we're punching above our weight. And that usage is still rapidly growing. And of course, all this requires some kind of a automation or unlimited resources, which we unfortunately don't have. Right, that, that, that's great. That's a, that's a great introduction, some uh, context on, on your company, Temu. And I, I must say that, of course, you brought up the, the, the topic of automation. And I have to say that I was, I was really impressed a few, a few months ago, I think, when we started uh, you know, our conversations, when I read that article about it that was titled the Zero Person Network Operation Center. So it's true that Elisa has, has been a leader in, in system automation for, for a while. And uh, um, yeah, and, and, and and, and then, of course, I found out, you know, continuing my research, that you do actually sell these. Uh, you, you offer not just uh, communication services, but you do offer your, your automation solutions, which is which is fantastic. So, yeah, uh, would it be possible for you to, to you know, tell us a, a little bit more about these automation initiatives and, and and in particular the ones that you are that you're involved in? Yeah, well, like I said, we are offering several automation solutions, but uh, in my best opinion. The EDN is the most interesting one, because that's the one I'm working with. <clears throat> EDN is a 
I would say a bit like SDN, but a sort of a super set of it. And uh, of course, I'm sure that all of you know what SDN is, but uh, here's just a brief reminder. So software defined networks separate data plane from control plane and that's application plane. So one could claim that uh, SDN enables automation. It also facilitates management and enables efficient configuration. And uh, all that sounds great. And it would be nice to say, let's have one of those. But as usual, things are not so black and white. And one important thing to remember is that this is not just for fancy cloud things, but also for traditional network elements. Because pure virtualization would make, would make things easier. But I would say that hybrid networks are here for here to stay for years to come. And uh, of course, there are a bunch of open source and commercial SDN tools available. But there's nothing that really matches our targets. And uh, available tools are mostly focused on the virtual world, or otherwise we feel they are unusable. So we decided to build one by ourselves, because we are. In addition to being an operator, we are also a software house. And uh, of course, that doesn't necessarily mean that we must do everything by ourselves. We do, want, we do not want to paint ourselves in the corner. And we might, for example, acquire suitable bits and pieces from here and there. But what we are not going to do is buy one-size-fits-all solution from anyone. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. So, um, just uh, let's let's spend a couple of minutes because, uh, of course, I, I see the. W w where do you? Um, well, let's let's talk a little bit about the importance. I mean, the, the the relevance and the kind of benefits of of automation. And I guess you know my my educated guess would be, you know, things like reducing you know the the, the cost to to deliver service or reduce the time to solution. Uh, you mentioned 5G, and and I guess that's that's something that every every major, I mean, every telco is going is a, is a process, is a is this rollout is something that all companies are going through, and that that's I'm I'm sure it's driving some uh, modernization on the networks and and, and investment uh, to 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 make their networks uh, you know capable of of uh, of, uh, of accommodating the, the the requirements of 5G. Can you tell us a little bit more about about your experience in that space and 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 why you see these uh, uh, this level of automation and increased level of automations are, are important and, and are valuable. Yes, yeah, indeed. And uh, you're correct. The time to market and all, all that is important. And uh, 5G, that, that's a whole new world. A naive view about 5G is that we just add a new radios in the cell towers, but that's definitely not enough. We need to modernize our cell site routers and introduce new devices, actually thousands of new devices into our network. And uh, it's not just enough to get them wired, they need to be configured and provisioned to. And uh, all that would require countless of man hours and it's actually very error prone. So I don't think we have any other way than to automate even more. And of course we want to go go far beyond that, because SDN enables us to do things, things and build automation on top of it. So we want to do things like a incentive-driven networks, which means that uh, you don't need to know what to do, you just need to know what the end result should be. We are already, already doing things like a zero touch, which means a plug and play type of devices, so when we want to correct, connect a new device into network, and it should know its place and receive its configuration and role automatically, and that's exactly what we need for a 5G construction. We also want to do closed loop optimization with a machine learning applied, and that, that's quite nerdy, but if you are a nerd, then it's cool that I'm being cool. And, uh, Another aspect is that we want to take the power back with multi-vendor approach. Because of course we will continue, continue to work with traditional and upcoming vendors. 
but we want to keep the control in our hands and the balance needs to be right. We want to be able to introduce the most efficient devices into, not, into our network, not to be kind of a, a task to the certain types of machines. And uh, we are also, we're building things for our own, own needs. We are also planning to make a great chunk of it commercially available, but only after it has been combat proven in our network. And uh, all this is great, but this kind of automation is nearly impossible, or at least very hard, without a sort of a situational awareness, which means that we need to know what's in our network and what's the status of it. And this should happen in real time, if possible. Yeah, exactly. And that's a perfect segue for my for my next next, next question, because I was going to say, let's talk about graphs. <laughs> so, yeah, because uh, of course, if you if you I mean, the, the, the simple concept is if, if you want to automate uh, different tasks on your network, whether that's provisioning, whether that's troubleshooting, whether that's, you know, any, any kind of operations on your network, you need some kind of representation of your network. And you say that that needs to be real time as close to real time as possible. It can it has to be dynamic. It has to be so. Uh, tell us a little bit more about, you know, how did you come up with the idea of, of, of using graphs in the first place and how a little bit of maybe how was your, your journey, I mean, your path to adopt this new technology? Yeah, so uh, yeah. <clears throat> as, you, as you already mentioned, network topology itself is uh, nothing special, just some um, nodes, it's its vertices. And uh, of, of course, we could have used relational database to store that. And uh, all that we would require is a huge pile of joint tables, countless lines of complex SQL. And uh, I can't put my finger on it, but for some reason, it didn't feel right. <laughs> and on the other hand, graph database fits like a glove. So we we spent some time carefully thinking about how we want to handle provisioning and what would, what we would like to fetch from our inventory, especially when consider, considering that we want to push automation to maximum. And uh, Elisa already had some in-house experience from uh, other graph databases. And uh, I had used, actually used Neo4j earlier in, early in my career. So we, would, we knew what we could gain by ad adapting graph approach. And also we wanted to do and actually are doing microservices. So we don't need to think about data stores as general. We could just take the best persistence approach for this use case. And uh, in, in that context, graph database was a was like a no-brainer. That great. That makes uh, that makes a lot of sense. So and and um yeah, you mentioned microservices, but tell, can you tell us a little bit about your your the, the, the architecture that you you've come up with, and and if you can share a little bit about, uh, uh, for example, the you know what languages frameworks have you used? I mean, this is more a question for the software software developers that will be joining us today, and architects people from the software side that might be interested to uh, to know a, a little bit about about your your solution, and also things like you know what. Data sources. I mean, how you build your graph? Where you get data from, and and uh, and how it's consumed? I mean, have you you know built some kind of yeah. integrations? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, first and foremost, we are in production. We have a couple of Jira that's related services available, and backlog full of new fancy features waiting to be implemented. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, Regarding our tech stack, tech stack we, we of course have a Neo4j causal cluster and uh, like I said, microservice architecture for data management. Uh, we're, we are mostly using Kotlin to build things and uh, Python in some carefully selected places. Uh, our services are highly decoupled and uh, everything works in an event-driven manner. We have a several data streams to keep our graph stocked. We are, of course, using, a, I would say, traditional element managers to gain data. We are re listening uh, telemetry events. And we are also doing our own network discovery, discovery things. And we have still loaded, lots of room to develop there. 
but the main point is that we don't use any existing data stores to import and populate the graph. What we want to do, we want to build it real time and that graphs, it represent our network exactly as it is. So we're doing multiple kind of a, listening multiple event streams and doing doing discovery discovery things by ourselves. And also the regarding the regarding the consuming part. Once more the automation, I really like that word. Our target is not to expose the graph via graphical user interface, but to use it for automation. Uh, of course, we have also identified that once we have properly modeled and collected this data, it offers almost endless possibilities for our network management and actually far beyond that. Things like a analytics and anomaly detection, including, for example, detec detecting single point of failures becomes so much easier. That, that that's great yeah makes makes perfect sense so and and i don't know if that's directly your your responsibility but you probably of course know from from the team so how was the the for example things like the modeling experience you mentioned before that and we actually have done it for years like represent networks in relational databases because that was the the only way uh, to 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 store data and to query data but how was you know the this this shift this change in the paradigm to think so uh, think of, of, of your domain as, as connected entities, as node, uh, as relationships, and um, and how is, is it different from other projects you you worked on before and other types of, of data stores? Yeah, yeah. The main difference, and it's actually a huge difference regarding the modeling, is that we can model things as they actually are in the real world or virtual world in our network. We don't need to think about things like a normalization and this allows us to benefit for our domain experts and their expertise. They can, they can help us modeling and they can easily understand our models and this is, uh, this is actually a huge thing for us. And uh, the actual models, I would love to share them with you but as they re represent our network quite accurately they are classified. Hopefully this diagram gives you a hint what we are modeling and storing in our graph. It's basically a different layers of OSI model that are modeled and stored. And uh, well, puritanism didn't work in the 16th century and it doesn't work here either, but I would say that the physical layer we have modeled, nodes and connections, pretty much as they are in the real world. They are then connected to the wonders of logical layer, which contains another set of nodes and connections and so on. And this, this is, allows us to create traverse, traversals, for example, from the port of the car to the service, which might be ultimately connected to paying customer, which is nice. And this is a huge thing for us. We can detect, for example, which customers are affected if we modify thing in our network or we can detect if there is a hardware failure and uh, modeling this kind of things with graph database I, I wouldn't say it's easy but the models are so much better compared to kind of a normalizing data and trying to fit it in the in the relational world yeah I, I couldn't agree more and that that's a great example of what I was trying maybe I don't know if I was clear enough in the introduction, but these, I mean, if you think of this, uh, this multi-layer diagram that you have there, I mean, each of the layers is a, is a graph on its own, but then it's also super powerful that you can represent connections across layers, like whether these are dependencies or, or any, any other kind of, of connections. And, you know, I, I'm just thinking how would, what would that look like in a, in a relational database? And that makes me <laughs> feel nervous. But uh, it, I mean, of, of course, ultimately you can do it, but it would introduce a, a horrible, you know, amount of, of artificial complexity. I mean, having to force that, kind of shoehorn that into into tables and 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 foreign keys and primary keys. So I think this is a this is a fantastic fantastic example. And um, yeah, so and and uh, maybe a, a question uh, that might be relevant for, for the audience as well. So now now graphs are are growing in popularity. So it's. Uh, 
it's been, I was going to say it's the year of the graph. It's been the year of the graph for, for, for a while now. And, and, but basically, we see them uh, going mainstream. And, and, uh, and what, why, why would you uh, decide to go with Neo4j of all the, all the available options? Did you consider alternatives? Did you go through some kind of formal uh, sort of, of, of due diligence? You know, did you run proof of concept with other, other graph uh, platforms? Yeah. Well, okay, yeah. One slide before that, just oh, to mention that uh, we have around 1.3 million nodes and 1.9 million connections, so we're oh. we're doing 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 production great stuff. But uh, to answer your questions, I think we can move two slides forward. Okay, right. Sorry, <laughs> we're not perfectly synchronized yeah. on that. Oh, there, there you go. Just... Extra slide between. So. Why new for Che? Well, I say this before Hesus gets my mic off, but there are other good graph databases in the market. And uh, like, like I mentioned, we all actually have in house experience in some of them. But uh, when you for Che, one thing is that, uh, as, as already mentioned, we are doing microservices and we want to have a best database for, for that microservice, for that context. So we don't care about uh, things like multi-model databases, or a, we don't we don't want to store documents in the Neo4j. We want to have efficient querying and efficient graph traversal, and that's exactly what Neo4j is offering to us. Also, kind of a essential point for us is the cipher, which is a I would say very expressive query language, and uh, together with extensive libraries, it offers pretty much everything what we need in a nice package. Uh, the graph model, which which Neo4j offers, native labeled property graph, it's it's a perfect fit for our use case, and uh, which is about efficient traversal, not so much about visualization. And uh, of course, the maturity. This is kind of a essential piece for our automation, and uh, we like to keep it running. Never J is mature. There is a good clustering support. We we really appreciate that. And uh, for us also, <clears throat> the in-house deployment is essential. The data is pretty sensitive, and uh, since we are an operator, we have a uh, things like private data centers and also private cloud. So we would like, we like to deploy things there. And Neo4AJ offers all of this just in a, in a very nice package. That's good. Very nice words. Thank you very much. So I think we, we're coming to the, to the end of, um, of, of the content that we had uh, for today. So I was going to ask if you have any, any final thoughts before we go with some of the questions from the, from the audience. Yeah, here's a kind of a brief, brief summary. What you have learned today, you you can remember that the Finns are using loads of mobile data, almost as much as uh, Germans, and there are ten times of more Germans than Finns. Oh, wow! And five uh, G is really, really great, but you need automation, kind of a, to really get it running. We are building things for us, but we are also selling things. And uh, automation, that is, that is so important. And I encourage everyone to try, try crafts. And of course, final words, if you travel to Finland, use mobile data in Elisa <laughs> network, of course, uh, using your fancy new 5G device. There is a good chance that the data flows through the network elements, which have been provisioned with EDN, using the data stored in a graph. So enjoy your craft data when visiting in Finland. <laughs> That's a great one. Thank you. Thank you very much, Temu. So I have one, one, one question from, from, the, from the audience before we, before we finish. And it is whether we could share some, uh, some uh, numbers or even approximate ones about the size of your, of your current graph and the kind of query rates that you have. I mean, whether, you know, both read, read and write, I mean. So and I, I seem to have noticed a slight 
going past that we didn't spend much time on. So probably we'll go back to, to that one because that answers partially at least that question, right? Yeah, yeah. So around 1.3 million nodes and uh, around 1.9 million connections, but they are kind of a, that's only the current situation. I think we, we shall have quite soon about double and it's, mm -hmm. I do feel it's ever growing. Currently, we are kind of in a, we are in pr production, but not in the full full scale production. So, query rates are rather rather kind of a, how uh, well let's say not too high at the moment. But of course, they are they are ever growing. So we are prepared to have loads of more. But the current figures are not so kind of a representative regarding regarding the coming months. Right. Yeah, and, and in a way, it kind of makes sense because this is, you know, if we, if we look at the, the, the typical deployment sizes, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at other use cases, not necessarily in the in the um, in the telco space, but here we're representing a network topology, which is, I mean, even in, even the largest ones, it's not going to be like in the billions of nodes. I mean, as you as you include new elements, like you were mentioning before, things like uh, you know internal structural devices or, or or even telemetry, or I don't know that that can grow. But a topology, I mean, even in the largest countries, will not contain you know billions of devices, right? That's that's never going to be the case. No, no. <clears throat> the kind of a that's, essential that's part great. is traversal and the connections instead of huge amount of nodes. Of course, well, 1.3 million is is more than a few. But uh, anyway, oh. we, we are not going to be ever in the uh, kind of a range of billions. That's great. Excellent. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Temu. I don't have any, any more questions today. So uh, one more time, thank you very much for sharing your, your experience today. And to all, all the audience, I mean, the, the recording will be, will be available soon in YouTube, in our YouTube channel. So uh, I guess that's, that's all for, for today from us. Thank you very much, Temu. And uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. <laughs>